Great. <laughs> okay, thanks for the nice introduction. I'm going to present to you the main project of my PhD thesis. And thank you for all who are still joining the meeting at this late time of day. So first of all, I'd like to give a brief um, background of the, of the topic. So we know that human metabolism is highly variable and uh, can have extreme shapes on a spectrum of bioenergetic capacity. So the capacity, for example, to metabolize glucose or to metabolize fat. And at the lower part of the spectrum, we have subjects that are diseased. And in these subjects, we know that defective enzymes that are either inborn or acquired um, diseases lead um, to change blood metabolite levels. One of the best examples, of course, is uh, in type 2 diabetes, where we see uh, increased um, blood glucose levels as a metabolite that can be used for diagnosis. On the other end of the spectrum, extreme concentrations of muscular enzymes, for example, succinate dehydrogenase, which is an uh, enzyme of the respiratory chain, are uh, present in the muscles of athletes and translate into extreme physiological capacity and into extreme physiological performance that these athletes achieve. So therefore, we asked ourselves, do these extreme muscular enzymes that we know um, athletes have and have in their musculature also translate like they do in diseases into change blood metabolite levels? Therefore, uh, the aim of the study was to compare the blood metabolome of four bioenergetically different groups um, of healthy males before and after an exercise challenge. We recruited three groups of um, highly trained and competitive athletes. So these athletes were all competing uh, on a German national level. The first group was a group that has a high anabolic capacity, so a high capacity to build up muscle mass. Those were natural bodybuilders training for over eight hours of resistance exercise per week. The second group were um, 400 meter sprinters and 400 meter hurdles runners that were training for over eight hours um, sprint or speed training per week and have a high glycolytic capacity. And a third group were endurance athletes that have a high oxidative capacity. For this group, we specifically recruited triathletes that train for long distance competitions. Um, the fourth group was a control group, as you yeah, as some would say, average shows or in German Otto Normals that were sedentary for at least six months before the study and were allowed um, to do at maximum one hour of exercise per week. To find out if our four groups with different bioenergetic um, capacity also have different blood metabolomes, we did a metabolomics before and immediately after exhaustive exercise. Our protocol looked like this, that uh, in preparation for the study, so seven days uh, until 24 hours before the study, subject pro subjects protocol their diet, training and nutritionary supplements. And 24 hours before, they followed a standardized nutrition plan and refrained um, from exercise and caffeine. And on a testing day, they reported to the lab in the morning at 7 a.m. We had a physician quickly um, check the heart and the lung if everything is fine for a exercise testing and did anthropometrics measurements. Afterwards, we took a first um, blood sample, which was of course fasted. And then the participants were asked to complete a so-called maximum endurance capacity test. This test is characterized by cycling on a stationary bike, whereas the load on the bike is increasing linearly at a rate of 30 watts per minute until the participant cannot cycle anymore, until voluntary exhaustion is how you call it in exercise physiology. Um, what you can see here in the picture is that the participant is wearing this blue mask. Um, over this mask, we continuously monitored gas exchange, oxygen uptake and CO2 exhalation. Exactly five minutes afterwards, so after maximum exhaustion, we took the second blood sample. And then after a break, the participants completed um, a battery of strength testings containing of grip strength, um, leg strength, and reactive strength, and they were finished at 11 a.m. in the morning. The fasted and the five minutes post-exercise blood sample were centrifuged and the serum was harvest harvested. And then we did a targeted metabolomics analysis using the BioCrates uh, P180 kit. 
from the targeted analysis um, of the P180 kit, we got 188 metabolites in 44 biological ratios or sums, and which were quality controlled. And after quality control, we had 151 and 43 ratios remaining for imputation and data analysis. And so the data analysis um, was done in three steps. The first step was the analysis of phenotype differences. So we wanted to know or wanted to verify if the athletes and the control groups are actually different in the key phenotypical parameters that was done by using an ANOVA. And the second step was a global metabolite, um, global analysis of metabolite differences between groups done by PLSDA and by the PLSDA also identifying key metabolites that separate these groups. In the end, uh, we looked at the, yeah, at the exercise effect on metabolites per se using a t-test of all groups. I won't show these results here, but I will show the results where we looked at the group-specific effect of exercise on metabolites. So are there, are there metabolites that change differently um, in one group than in the others in response to exercise? <clears throat> On the first step, I said we wanted to verify if athletes are different in key phenotypical traits. Therefore, we used the ANOVA to compare um, phenotypical traits, like for example, what you can um, see here, height, body fat, BMI, so whole um, anthrop anthropometry, um, key endurance parameters that were measured during the endurance capacity test, strength parameters, and also we looked if the protocol training of the athletes uh, is really um, statistically different between the groups. I just want to highlight some of the findings or some of the significances here. We see that bodybuilders have uh, a significantly higher BMI, which is not surprising because they have a really high muscle mass uh, compared to their height. Um, Untrained controls or sedentary controls had um, significantly higher subcutaneous fat measures at the upper arm and the thigh compared to the others, whereas endurance athletes and sprinters had um, the lowest body fat percentages. All the endurance-related parameters like ventilatory threshold, VO2 max, lactate, were significantly um, better, lower or higher, depending on the parameter, in endurance athletes and reactive strength was uh, best in sprinters. Unsurprisingly, the natural bodybuilders did the most resistance exercise, endurance athletes most endurance exercise, and the sprinters did um, mostly speed or significantly more speed training, but also had relatively high proportion of resistance training, which is normal in these athletes. <clears throat> In the second step, now I uh, told before, we looked at uh, the global metabolite differences of our four recruited groups, and we found that natural bodybuilders and endurance athletes have distinct metabolomes in uh, this PLSTA analysis. What you can see here is that uh, the base and post exercise values of every subject. Um, interestingly for us was also that uh, and metabolomes and this analysis of sprinters and untrained controls were overlapping. So now we wanted, of course, to know uh, which are the key metabolites that drive the, the differences in bodybuilders and endurance athletes compared to the other groups. And what we found was that in natural bodybuilders, branched chain amino acids, so valine, leucine, isoleucine, were all significantly lower than in the other groups. Whereas DHA, so the cosahexanoic acid containing phosphatidylcholines, were increased in natural bodybuilders. And also sphingomyelines with 22 carbons were increased. In endurance athletes, we found an increased CPT1 ratio. CPT1 stands for carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1 ratio, is a mitochondrial transmembrane enzyme. And uh, increased lysophosphatidylcholines with 18 carbons and decreased alkylacylphosphatidylcholines. In the next slides, I will go into detail into some of the bolded metabolites or ratios. So in detail, uh, when we look at the differences in bodybuilders compared to all other groups, we saw this lower uh, branch chain amino acid pool. On the left-hand side, you can see here an example of BCAA 
um, isoleucine, which was significantly lower in uh, natural bodybuilders. So uh, we hypothesized that the reason for this can be one, an increased protein synthesis that people who train a lot of resistance exercise, like natural bodybuilders, have, plus two, uh, an increased muscle mass that these subjects has, and that, that these two things lead to a depletion of blood amino acids um, after the fasting period that subjects needed to do before the study. A practical conclusion of this would be that for subjects who either have a high muscle mass and want to build up muscle mass, this does not only translate into natural bodybuilders, but also in subjects that had a disease and need to build up muscle mass quick, that they need to refill their, uh, their amino acids or their proteins in the morning when they get up uh, in order to avoid that they run empty on blood amino acids. The second finding that was different in um, natural bodybuilders were higher DHA containing phosphatidylcholines. When we look at the graph here, uh, you can see that this statistical difference probably comes from the upper two participants here. And what we did then was we looked at the um, nutritional and supplementary diaries of the subjects, and we found that these two subjects were supplementing fish oils. Uh, which are rich in um, omega-3 comprising DHA and those are known in the bodybuilder community or taken frequently in the bodybuilder community to increase uh, because they're known to increase a muscle protein synthesis. <clears throat> now when we look in detail into the differences in endurance athletes compared to all others, uh, we saw an increased CPT1 ratio and increase, increased lysopcs with 18 carbons I will just go into detail into the um, difference in CPT1 ratio here. You can see in the graph here that the CPT1 ratio is um, higher pre and post exercise in endurance athletes. And what's also interesting here is that whereas in all endurance athletes, a CPT1 increases after exercise, it does that only, or this is only the fact for the minority of subjects in the other groups. What could be the reason for this? CPT1 is a um, mitochondrial transmembrane enzyme that transports fatty acids from the cytosol into the mitochondria, which can then enter beta oxidation. What this ratio indicates is the efficiency of beta oxidation, so the activity of this, um, of this reaction. And therefore we assumed that either it is the fact that uh, our endurance athletes have uh, at baseline, higher capacity to oxidize fat or acutely higher fat oxidation rates due to the exercise they did. What supports this assumption is that during the time course of exercise, you can see here the RER. The RER is, a rest, is um, short for respiratory exchange ratio. This is measured via the mask that the um, subjects wore during the exercise. And a lower RER um, a lower RER indicates higher rates of fat oxidation. And what you can see here is that endurance athletes, despite cycling for longer time, had lower um, RER, which means that they had a higher proportion of fat oxidation compared um, to all of the other subjects. So this supports um, yeah, our hypothesis that the CPT1 ratio that is higher here in endurance athletes um, stands for a higher capacity for fat oxidation and or acutely higher fat oxidation rates, probably both in endurance athletes. We also looked um, if there is a um, specific exercise effect in one group. So is one group, uh, one metabolite different in one group reacting to the exercise compared to the other groups. And I want to highlight also one finding here, namely we found that, hexo that is, this is the case for hexosa, also for tetradecanylcarnitine, which were increased more in endurance athletes than in all other groups. I just want to show the graphs for hexosa here. You can see that endurance athletes have a higher concentration change in hexosa compared to all the other subjects. So hexosa mainly comprises of glucose in this assay. And at intense, moderate to intense exercise, glucose that is stored in glycogen in the body is the main fuel during moderate to intense exercise. Therefore, the liver has to produce more glucose in order to sustain the muscles with energy. 
we now see that endurance athletes have more glucose in their blood compared to the others. So this could mean that they um, take up less glucose in their muscles. And actually, the fact is that the glycogen content in skeletal muscle differs with endurance training status. So the intramuscular glucose stores are higher in endurance trained subjects. And when you look at the numbers here, over, can be over two times higher in endurance trained subjects than in controls, which means that endurance trained people need less glucose from the blood um, compared to untrained subjects. And that, as we saw in the slide before, endurance trained subjects have higher rates of fat oxidation, therefore also probably need um, less glucose. So to sum up, we saw in the PLSDA that the natural bodybuilders and the endurance athletes actually have distinct metabolite profiles before and after maximum exercise. Surprisingly, we saw that sprinters and untrained controls share similar metabolite profiles. And for some of the differences that we found between the groups could be traced back um, to different bioenergetic capacity which is due to long-term training, for example, in the CPT1 ratio, indicating uh, more efficient beta oxidation endurance athletes, or specific nutrition that we saw in the DHA containing PCs that we could um, trace back to the fish oil supplemented. However, plenty of metabolites, or probably roughly half of the metabolites that were different between groups could not yet be traced back easily to mechanisms of adaptation or nutrition and I need further investigation. Like I said, the difference in tetradecanoylcarnitine response after exercise. However, in the end, um, with this rather small study, we could still show that long-term specific training along with genetics, which we didn't um, include in our analysis and other athlete specific factors like diet systematically can change the blood metabolite concentrations addressed in after exercise. If you're interested in more details in the study, you can I find this in physiological reports. And we also have increased the cohort of the study to 35 participants and have untargeted metabolomics data coming soon. And in the end, I'd just like to um, thank all people who were involved in my PhD, especially uh, study participants that are the most important thing <laughs> for studies like this. And I'm happy to answer your questions now. Mm -hmm.